Good morning. Welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. We're so glad that you could join us for our Sunday morning broadcast. Uh, for those of you who are part of our congregation, we miss seeing you in a regular service, but uh, for whatever reason you have to be at home, uh, God bless you in that, and uh, we just pray that uh, today's message would uh, encourage your heart. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, or maybe you're from out of the area and you're watching, um, bless you. Uh, gl- glad to have you with us this morning. And we're going to be starting, uh, or continuing, I should say, rather, uh, our series in the book of First Peter. So would you bow with me in prayer as we start this morning service? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to come here and to hear your word. Lord, I just pray that you give me strength and uh, your Holy Spirit's uh, insight to be able to speak the words from the scripture that you would have the people hear and that their hearts would be open to hear what it is that, that you have to say. And God, that I would be on track with exactly uh, what this passage is trying to get across. And um, Lord, that you would help the people out there at home to uh, be able to glean some goodness from what happens today. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, we're continuing our series in the book of First Peter. And my text this morning is First Peter chapter 2. And I'll be speaking on verses 1 to 4. And my message title today is Building a Spiritual Appetite. Now, we see that uh, in the book of 1 Peter, we, we talked about this last week a little bit, that Peter has just finished reminding the saints um, that they have a glorious inheritance waiting for them in heaven that is uh, not subject to the same hopeless system of living um, that's embraced by the world outside of Christ, that's uh, basically uh, all for today and not thinking about what eternity has. And the Bible tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And God's people have a promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And uh, we can be forgiven, we can come to know God, and we can call, uh, come close to him, and that's for all of eternity. And uh, that plan that God has for the believer is simply miraculous, and the truth of God's word concerning that plan for all uh, eternity is the core uh, message of the gospel, how we can be reconciled to Jesus Christ, and how that carries on right from the present time when we, we accept Jesus as our Savior, into eternity, which has no boundaries. Since the temporary systems of this world will fade, like the flowers of the field and the grass that withers, um, the Apostle Peter instructs people to turn their faces towards God in holy living, out of a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this morning we continue in chapter 2, verse 1. The Apostle Peter says, Therefore... Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So we look at this passage, the the submission of our lives to being obedient is an immensely important issue that has huge relational consequences uh, with our Father God. And I'd like to start on this point by asking all of you a question. Um, In a human family circumstance, is it possible for a child to be in family relationship with their father and, and not be on the best terms with him? And I think the answer goes with, almost without saying that, yes, we can have a child and father relationship and the child can be distant from the father. Now, because our human fathers carry sinful natures and are full of imperfections, uh, fracturing in the closeness of that relationship can be uh, coming from the issues that the father has or it can come from the children's issues. But usually closeness between a biological father and child is broken through a combination of factors in that natural relationship. Uh, Relationships uh, are usually broken 
partly on both sides of the equation. And as a result of issues of brokenness we experienced in our human father and child relationships, um, sometimes our, our perceptions concerning having a relationship with our Heavenly Father can, can be deeply affected as well. So we may be going into a relationship with God carrying a number of trust issues. And we have to remember, though, unlike our human fathers, our Heavenly Father, um, who, who is everlasting, and the Bible says He is good and perfect and pure and holy, um, he, he doesn't fail us or hurt us in the same way as our human fathers can. Uh, the Bible tells us that God is perfect in all of his ways. Second Samuel uh, 22, 31, as a matter of fact, tells us, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. And the psalmist, King David, says in Psalm 145, 17 and 18, he says, The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and faithful in all that he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, all who call on him in truth. And 1 John chapter 3 to 12 gives us a glimpse of the character of our heavenly dad when it says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And in James chapter 1, 16-17, it is, we are told concerning our Heavenly Father, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So then, unlike frac our fractured relationships with our earthly fathers, um, any interruption of true closeness with our heavenly Father um, does not come from quirks or injustice or character flaws on God's part. Um, no, the problems are always with us. And these problems are what the Bible refers to as sin. Now the Israelites, for instance, were, were chosen by God to be his children. They were chosen to be a people that would be the ambassador nation to the world for God. And through the Old Testament we see their travels. And, and God gave them good things and asked them to have a relationship with him. But they were, well, how would you say it, a rebellious lot. And they pushed away from God. Now Isaiah the prophet spoke for God's feelings on the matter when he wrote in Isaiah 65, chapter 65, verse 2. He says, All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. They were brought into his family and were given everything but then they disregarded God's gifts. And over a series of generations, as a collective society, they rejected the truth and embraced their own unhealthy behaviors. One of the prophets of the Lord, named Hosea, he lamented over the rebellion of the Israelite nation when he writes in Hosea 8, 3-5, Israel cries out to me, Our God, we acknowledge you. But Israel has rejected what is good. An enemy will pursue him. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Samaria, throw out your calf idol. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? So one might say, however, that this lament, uh, that was all to do with Israel stuff, and it's got nothing to do with us today. But when we say this, we lose sight that we are God's children because he has adopted us and he has brought us into his family and, and, and we have the same call on our hearts to follow after him in the same way that the Israelites did in the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 11, 25 to 32, it is written this. 
I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that you, they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. So God's purpose in sending Jesus was for bringing all of his children into mercy. Israel rebelled, and as did the Gentile world, but God laid on Jesus the sins of the entire world. He died for all of us. The ceremonial law of Moses was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but the moral law of God does not change, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change like shifting shadows, as we've read. This is why Peter calls the church to conform to God's call to be like him in our attitudes, saying, Therefore, in our text today, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So, we need to be ridding ourselves of these things. Peter Peter tells us to rid ourselves, to put aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. This means, what this actually means is that there's still a propensity for people under a new covenant relationship with God to stray in their hearts, to make unwise choices, to embrace unhealthy thinking and behavior patterns. We're sinners, and I've said this many times before, where there is a new dog inside of us, we're born again in the spirit, there's a new spiritual man inside of us, but there's also a carnal man an old dog inside of us. And the one that we feed the most is the one that grows strongest and dominates. Christians can, uh, can allow the old man to dominate them. Now, some believe that everything is okay with, uh, with them because you know, they're not smoking, getting drunk, chewing tobacco, or sleeping around. Now, those unhealthy behaviors that I just mentioned are things to avoid, for sure. But how about the sin of malice? Deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Um, do believers condemn some sins um, but tolerate others? Well, when we look at the teachings of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we see God desires that his people live according to his holy standards, whether they're from the Old Testament morality uh, in the Old Testament age or the New Testament moral- morality in the New Testament age. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Romans 6, 16 to 23, as believers, we're told this. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. As a born-again Christian, the Bible tells me that I am God's child. I'm no longer a slave to sin. But I serve and I I love the Lord if I've truly given my heart over to Him. Now, now as a believer, I'm not a robot. I I must choose. I must make choices. And when I yield, it is no longer my old nature. When I yield to God, it's no longer my old nature that has controls. But I'm relinquishing control of my life over to the Holy Spirit. But my flesh, he, he... He's, he rises up and he wants to take back control. And I can give him control as if I choose to follow my old nature. And this is why Peter asks the church to yield to the Holy Spirit within them and set aside the things that are wrong. The Apostle Paul writes, um, you know, yield to the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the sin nature. For the Spirit desires what is opposing the sin nature. It's not legalism to choose to embrace holiness. It's not. Now, now God's very interested in our motivation for doing that. He wants us to choose to be obedient to him and out of, out of love for him. Last week we talked about this. 
And, and salvation is not something that we can earn through doing good deeds. Salvation does not come from saving myself by obeying the law of God. Um, we're not declared righteous by obeying the law or by what we hear today, being good people. It's only by faith through Jesus Christ that we're, we're saved because in ourselves, our, our, even our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. We can't possibly even hope to come cl- as clean as we need to be to um, be close to God. Not in ourselves. No, but once I'm saved, the command given by God for me is to love Him with everything I've got. And if loving Him means that I long to be in close relationship with Him, um, if longing to be in relationship uh, with Him leads to me wanting to honor Him, if honoring Him means that I embrace holiness and push away from the table of wickedness, then I will obey Him, and the result will be that I will be relationally close to God. See, just like the human relationship where we can be close to our Father or distant from our Father, in the spiritual relationship, even, even though we're saved, we can either be close to God or we can be distant from God. Now, if I love God perfectly, I will be perfectly freed from all entanglement, entanglements of sin. Um, the problem is that we all have trust issues with God at times and we fail to love Him perfectly. When I struggle and sometimes I fall, it's not as though I have been positionally separated from God because I'm His Son. But relationally, I have to ask God for forgiveness because if I do not do this, my relationship with Him will be strained, will be distant when I ought to be close with Him. Well, let's talk about malice. Have you ever struggled with malice? In definition, malice is uh, a desire to cause pain, injury, or distress to another. Have you ever had this desire? If you had, you're not alone. Peter says to put aside all malice. If, if I will walk closely with the Lord because of the indwelling presence of God's Spirit, I am a new creation in Him. I am not bound over to disobedience. I actually have the capacity in the spirit to push away from the table of malice and to rid myself of all feelings of hatred, feelings like I'd like to cause pain, injury, or distress to another person. The same goes for deceit. Have you ever found yourself being deceitful? God does not desire his people to live deceitfully, and uh, to live in a lie is to be... Um, kind of living uh, a double life, right? And we know that Satan is the father of all lies and he wants us to be deceitful. So he tempts us to be deceitful and not be honest with God or with others. And Peter says that as God's children, we're, we're to set this behavior pattern aside. Now, as, as an unbeliever, you're bound in chains of disobedience. But as a believer, you're not bound as a slave to sin, You've been given freedom and a capacity and the Holy Spirit to be absolutely obedient to God and to live a life that pleases Him. So you don't have to follow in the path of deceitfulness. If you've got a problem with being deceitful, you need to ask God to forgive you and to give you the strength to, uh, to be honest. Well, what about hypocrisy? Let's talk about that. Do children of God sometimes struggle with being double-minded? Yeah, double-minded. I just talked about deceitfulness being double-mindedness. Well, hypocrisy is, uh, is double-mindedness uh, in the open. Deceit is in behind the scenes. Hypocrisy is like living one way um, when I'm downtown with my buddies and another way when I'm at church with Mrs. Jones and the choir. Um, do children of God struggle with being double-minded? Yes. And um, have you ever fallen into this trap? I know I have. And the Lord doesn't desire us to be double-minded and calls us to repentance if we're struggling with double-mindedness. We're, we're called to set double-minded hypocrisy aside. Well, what about envy? Do, do true, true believers not struggle with every other human being? Um, it's human nature when we have a, an old beater truck looking at the 2018 to 2020 model park next to ours, uh, 
it's human nature to feel a little bit jealous and envious of that guy's position. And, and uh, the Bible says that we ought to set, lay aside all this kind of thinking. So when we're tempted to envy other people for what they have or what, you know, and, and think about what we don't have, you know, we, do we envy their house? Do we envy their car? Do we envy their spouse? Do we envy their family? What, I mean, there's many things that we can envy over. <coughs> Peter says, lay aside all such things. What about slander? Slander of every kind. Gossip. Are true Christians exempt from struggling with the temptation to dissect other people negatively behind their backs? Absolutely not. We're tempted to, um, to dig in. And the Bible says that gossip is like the juicy morsels served at a dinner table. And, and they're, they're something that our flesh craves. And, and I'm positive that there's both roasted pastors out there and roasted parishioners over the years at, at Christian dinner tables. And uh, this is plainly wrong and it's been... It's out of line with God's Spirit. It really is. Why? Because our propensity to be tempted to wander is very real. And um, I don't know, there's something about putting other people down in our sin nature that makes us feel better about ourselves because we know that we're not perfect. So to look at another person and cut them down um, is almost to say that, look, I don't, I'm not as bad as that person. And, and that just, that's just wrong. So, um, the choice is ours, and, and we need to choose to push away from the table of gossip. If someone tries to cut someone down in front of you, kindly uh, say, listen, I don't want to talk about that person negatively, and, and uh, I, I just would rather not speak about that. And if the other person doesn't respond well, then just walk away. But don't be participating with character assassination at someone else's dinner table. Um, it's not pleasing to the Lord. Lay aside slander of every kind. Every, every kind. You know, as your pastor, I'm not going to do everything perfectly. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make a call. I'm going to preach a sermon that's not going to be tasteful to somebody. There's going to be all kinds of things that happen because I'm human. And some of that might be my fault. But... Please, you know, give me some grace. And God says to me, you give them grace too. You give everybody uh, grace. And if someone's struggling with something or if someone's done something wrong, well, I need to go up to that person and make it right with them. I need to talk with them about it or I need to pray about it. But I need to keep this shut and not dissect that person. So, uh, you know... One of the biggest turnoffs in the non Christian world over Christians is their propensity to gossip. And so many people have been hurt by this. We've just got to stop it. Peter says, rid yourselves of slander of every kind. Rid yourselves of it. It's a choice. Yield to the Spirit and, you know, and rid yourself of slander. I have the capacity to rid myself of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. And many other things I find myself naturally gravitating towards in the flesh. But to do this, I must yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and embrace God's true love. For it is only in Him that I will have the heart change and the power to overcome. So the Apostle Peter tells us that not only should we put aside things that detract from our closeness to our Father and to other people, but that we should crave pure spiritual milk. Now, Peter says that as believers, like infants, we ought to crave pure spiritual milk. And when sinners like us are born again in the Spirit, we're like spiritual babies that are in need of nourishment, need of spiritual milk, so that we can grow up. It's not that it's uh, God's will that we remain infants in the faith. That's not what this is being said here. And, and not learning to chew on solid food as we grow, but... What it's saying is that we need to have a hunger, like babies hunger for, for milk, for spiritual nourishment. And in this verse, the Apostle Peter is talking more about a spiritual appetite than he is about the substance, although the substance is milk, which is good for us as infants 
We need to uh, drink spiritual milk. Although a new believer needs to crave the basic understandings of the faith, in fact, one of the evidences of spiritual life in us is the hunger uh, for spiritual food from the Word of God. And as we continue to grow up in the Lord, we move from milk to meat and bread. But God desires that we have this spiritual craving of the Word, just like infants crave uh, their mother's milk. Now, we've all heard crying infants that uh, are hungry, and they cry out because that's all they know how to do when they're hungry. They, they feel the pangs of hunger, so they cry out. And they, they're saying, Mother, feed me. Feed me, Mother, feed me. That's what they're saying. Well, in our spirit, we need to have that same cry out in our spirit when we're undernourished, when we're, when we're walking through our life and we're not getting fed spiritually. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, what does the scripture say about that? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. So we hunger for pure spiritual milk like hungry infants that are, that are not satisfied until they're filled. And, um, uh, you know, we, we need to, when we come to Christ and we taste and we see that the Lord is good, we taste the spiritual blessings that, that are offered to us. And that, that uh, satiation of our hunger um, actually makes us want to put away our old sins of the flesh, uh, such as what Peter says is being malice, deceit, hypocrisy, and slander as we crave God's word, it replaces our hunger for all those wicked things. As commentator Warren Wearsby uh, states, our food um, needs to be the unadulterated word of God, not mixed with any human philosophies or, or doctrines. God wants us to grow up into our salvation now that we see that he is good. Has God been good to us? Yes. Has God been gracious to us? Yes. Has God given us spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing stacked up to the sky? Absolutely. And, and He wants us to continue to hunger and thirst for growing in Him. He doesn't want us to be living as adult babies. There's many Christians out there that live as adult babies and all they do is touch on the milk. They, they don't hunger and thirst like infants hungering and thirsting for the milk. They just have a taste once in a while of this and they never get past the milk. You see, an infant's natural hunger is to hunger for milk and as they grow and as they grow stronger, they begin to hunger for deeper food along with their milk like food, you know, like solid food that they can chew on. God's desire is that uh, we grow up and mature in our faith once we taste that He is good, that we continue growing and hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and we grow up strong and healthy and mature. God's desire is that. You know, I see a lot of immature Christians out there that have been Christians for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and they're still babes in Christ. They don't hunger and thirst after the milk of God's Word. They just want a taste of it once in a while. And, and when they naturally uh, you know, want to, to consume God's Word because of the work of the Spirit in them, you see, the Spirit uh, creates this hunger in them. And it actually leads us to a changed heart, which makes us desire and hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not something we can grab and put on. We can't create a hunger. The hunger comes as we, as we lay aside our, our, ourselves and we seek God and the Holy Spirit draws us and the Word becomes alive in us and it feeds us. And You know, I remember when I first rededicated my life back to Christ, I, I just couldn't get enough of God's Word. I, I'd been raised with the Bible. I, I learned from the Scriptures as a child, but it was kind of like, oh yeah, I, uh, I know this. And, and I know the, the teachings of the Word of God, but my hunger wasn't there. But when I rededicated my heart to Christ, and I said, Lord, I want you to have everything in me, everything that I am, everything that I have, it's yours. When I did that, God, the Holy Spirit, gave me a, an incredible hunger for the Word of God. So it just like I couldn't put the Word down, I just read page after page. And it was just like soaking my spirit in goodness. And I just craved it. I hungered and thirsted for it. And I grew because of that. 
God wants us to grow in our salvation now that we tasted that the Lord is good. He doesn't want us to continue living as adult babies. The sweet taste of nearness to Him should build within us a dread of the thought of ever wandering away from Him. You see, uh, our hunger for the Word is hunger for closeness with God. Are you hungry for closeness with God today? There, there's a lot of people out there that have gone through the motions of religious behavior because it's habit. But God's desire is that you draw near to Him. Are you hungry for Him? Are you hungry to know Him more? Are you hungry to be close to your Father? Well, lay aside all that stuff that doesn't matter. Come to the Lord. If you need to ask for forgiveness, come and ask for forgiveness. Create in me a clean heart, O God. All the clutter that I can put in between God and, and, and myself, God wants, God wants me to give it to Him. Lay it aside. Come to Him as that infant craves and cries out for pure milk, spiritual milk. Come to the Lord today. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this passage in First Peter that uh, tells us, Father, how we ought to live and encourages us, Lord, to crave to know you and to be close to you and to be nourished by your word, O oh God. Father, forgive us for the times where we wander from you, where we sort of wander aimlessly in this life. God, forgive us for that. Help us to be focused on knowing you and get coming close to you. I just pray out there that anyone who is struggling with closeness to you, God, that they would just give up their, their pride and they'd come to you and, and acknowledge the fact that they maybe have not put you as a priority in their lives. And God, I pray that you would re restore those people's souls today that are praying with me. And Lord, for those that don't know you, God, I just pray that they would see that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that you love them very deeply, and that you will set them free if, you, if they would only come to you, if they would only come to you and confess their sin, and ask you to be their Savior, that you would take their sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. You would establish them as your child, and, that they, and you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray that they would do that today. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.